and we will talk about different applications first and then we talk about these, these applications in particular. We talk about how HTTP works, how file transfer, email, DNS and P2P works. And so since these chapters are rather big, we are going to have many intermediate points in these chapters. So first module in this chapter is network application architecture. So we'll talk about what are the different protocol layers, what does P2P mean, what is process communication, what are the names, addresses, and ports, and what are the transports. So protocol architecture. We already know that TCP IP has a stack, has a layer stack, are layers. So we have the physical layer, then what was called data link layer, it is called host to network layer, now we generally call it data link layer. IP is the internet layer and then transport are TCP and UDP. For applications we have HTTP, FTP, SMTP, P2P, um, DNS, Skype and so on and so forth. These are all applications. So in this chapter we are going to talk about only those things on the top. We are not going to talk about much of this. So the applications could be two types, either client to server or peer to peer. Client to server is where there are few servers and all the clients reach to them. Okay? So when you go to Amazon, what kind of application you are using? Client to server. Actually, when you go to any web page, you are using client to server because there is a web page server and you are a web page client. Right? So this is the original architecture that is what most of the time, except for 10 or 15 years ago when P2P started, until then this was the common thing. We used to have servers and clients, servers and clients. Then they figured out that um, <coughs> P2P is also possible. So actually web servers, search engines, Google, social networking, Facebook, these are all client server applications. Right? But then P2P started. In that case, we don't really need a server, we can just exchange files among hundreds of us together. Right? So if you want to distribute a software for whatever reason, you can just put it on P2P and, and be done with it, you don't need to maintain a server or anything like that. Right? So, so anyway, so P2P is used a lot for illegal activities, but it's also done for illegal activities. So any anything actually you know is much faster to get by P2P than to get it by from the server. So that is P2P. File sharing, BitTorrent, EMU, LimeWire, etc., etc. Now Skype is also P2P. Okay, so we'll go into Skype. And in Skype, when you're talking to somebody else, you might be talking to somebody else's computer and so on and so forth. And the advantage of P2P is that it is highly scalable. Servers have a limited capacity. So if you, a server is designed for 1,000 people, if you have 2,000 people, server is gone. With P2P, there is no limit. Okay? So highly scalable, highly symmetric traffic, ISP unfriendly. Now the problem with the with the P2P is that the ISP networks are not really designed for P2P. So when they give you 18 megabits, they hope that you will use only 2% of the time, right, or 1% of the time. So they sell it to 100 people, 18 megabits, and the total capacity of 100 megabits they have. If everybody started doing P2P, which means they're continuously downloading at 18 megabits per a day, they are in trouble, <laughs> right? They cannot support it anymore. So they like to discourage it. So it's not very ISP friendly. ISP is internet service provider, right? Difficult to authenticate. Now second thing is you don't really know where you're getting the information from and um, whether the information is good or bad. There's a lot of garbage out there. And need and send to share. Everybody wants to download, nobody wants to upload, right? As soon as you download it, you log off, <laughs> done with it, <laughs> right? So the question is, how do we make sure that people remain up even when they don't need anything, just for other people, right? So that's something. 
All right, we'll talk about that when we come to P2P. But now at least you understand two things, that there is two ways to distribute information. One is by servers, and second is by P2P. Now, another concept you need to know is when you program a computer to do anything in Unix, then that is the mother of all operating systems. In Unix, they had sockets. So when you want to talk to another process, you had sockets. You just open a socket to that process, and then you write to the socket, read from the socket. So that's how most of the applications work. When the networking came around, the process could not, process could, does not have to be on your computer. It could be on some other computer. And so when you do any networking, you just write to the socket, and the socket sends it to TCP IP protocol stack, and then TCP IP protocol sends it to the other computer where the socket gives it back to them. All right? So whenever we use the word socket, most of you already know it, but basically this is the operating system interface for process-to-process -process communication. All right? Then we use the name Actually, we have already talked about the names and addresses, so I think the only thing we haven't talked about is the ports. So every computer has an address like this, and every computer could have a name. It doesn't have to have a name, right? So every computer could have a name, and so we can use DNS to translate the name into address. So there are servers to which, which, which we call DNS servers, domain name servers, to which you give the name and you get the address. And the address is what you need in the, in really, to get there. So for example, if you just said my name Rajan, you won't be able to get to me. But if you know my address, you could drive there. Right? Similarly on the network, you need my computer's address to talk to it. Right? So the address is finally we need. Now, remember these addresses, you might have already noticed it, but these are always four decimal numbers. So 209 is not hex. 209 is a 209 decimal number. Second thing, these numbers are always less than 256. So you will never find 256, you will find 255 maximum. 0 through 255. So there are 8 bits. All right? And there are 4 of them. So you have 4 times 8 bits, there are 32 bits. So the IP needs 32 bit addresses. It doesn't really need decimal or anything, it just needs binary. It needs 32-bit binary numbers, right? And since human beings cannot remember binary, they said, why don't we just write the numbers in decimal and write four decimal numbers that way? And so the program then can translate that into 32-bit binary number inside the computer. So when you see a packet on the net, if you were able to see a packet on the wire, you would see 32 bits of binary numbers of whatever you address you're trying to send. Now, every computer has many, many applications, many, many processes running. So how do you find which process you want to talk to? So every process has something called a port. So if you want to talk to a particular process, you give its port number. So, for example, if you want to talk to a web server, all the web servers generally use port 80. So you talk to port 80 on a computer, and if there's a web server, sorry, every time I go up, remind me again. So every time you, so 80, if you send to so some computer and say, I want to talk to port 80, it will connect to the web server. If you connect to 21, that is FTP. Some of you know already, right, FTP. So every application has a port number. These are called well-known ports. You don't have to use AT for, for web serving. You could have a web server which talks on port 81. In fact, in my home, I have 10 web servers. Why 10 web servers? Because I have one camera which has port number 81, another camera which has port number 82, another camera which has port number 83. All of these are web servers. All of them can be accessed by the web. I can log into any of the camera. I can see anything, right? So, so you need, so what do you do? I mean, you cannot have AT, all of them, right? So you do different port numbers. But there are well-known port numbers, which are generally, if you don't know any better, then just use the well-known port numbers. Okay. So 
this is like port. So this is like a country and then you want to get into, then you have to know which port you want to get into. Similarly, in, in a computer, there are processes and you want to know which process you want to get into, you have to know what port number you want to get into. All right, when we go into the detail later on, we will find out that the ports are really, they belong to the transport service, to the TCP and UDP, and the addresses belong to IP. So this is layer three addressing, and this is layer four addressing. These port numbers are layer four addressing, and the port numbers are 16 bit long. 16 bit long, so the maximum port number can be two raised to 15 or 16 minus one, something like that. See? Zero to two raised to 16 minus one, 16,000 something. All right. So before we get into applications, we just need to tell you about two transports we use. TCP and UDP. TCP is used for reliable data transfer. In TCP, whenever you send a packet, the acknowledgement comes back. So when you send a packet, you get the acknowledgement that I got the packet. And so it is reliable. If somebody does not get the acknowledgement, you know that the packet did not make it, you time out and you resend it again. In UDP, there is no acknowledgement. You send the packet and hope that it got there. So this is for unreliable data transfer and this is for reliable data transfer. Each packet has a number. So when you get an acknowledgement, it says I got everything up to packet number 45. So you don't have to worry about anything up to 45. You can throw away your copy of them. They already made it to the destination. In this one, it is optional. Every packet is act, every packet is not act. I mean, no packet is act. Last packets are retransmitted, there is no retransmission. It may cause long delays. What that is, so all of this is positive, but the negative is that if something gets lost, then you're waiting forever for the acknowledgement and it can be, you know, you may wait a long time. There are some applications that don't like that. What are those applications? Audio and video. I mean, if I said something, now if you didn't get it, are you going to wait until you receive it again, or you would rather go on and say, okay, let's send me the next word, what he said. All right, most of us would rather go on to the next word than, you know, then, and then stop and then wait for the next, you know, so on and so forth. So, so, the, so this is cause long delay, where this is, it doesn't cause any delay that much, and so this quick. Um, so this is connection-oriented service. So before you can do TCP, you have to set up a connection with the destination, and that's important here, not like circuit switching. In circuit switching, you have to set up the connection through every hop. In TCP, we don't set up anything at every hop. We just set up with the end system. So if I'm talking to him at the corner, then I tell him that, look, I want to talk to you TCP. He says, yeah, go ahead, talk to me. Then I will say, here's my packet number one. He says, yeah, acknowledgement for packet number one, packet number two, acknowledgement for packet number two. And then I say, okay, disconnect, and done. I like, the routers in between don't know anything about this packet number stuff or anything like that. They don't care. They just know the source and destination. They don't know something is lost or not, anything like that. They don't care for any of that. But TCP cares. So the TCP is connection-oriented, where UDP is connection-less means you don't have to set up any connection. You could just send a packet, and that's it. So this is good for reliable and delay insensitive applications. This is good for last tolerant and delay sensitive applications. So anything that can lose packets and not care about it, and which in which delay is important, those applications use UDP, and those applications are telephony, streaming, multimedia, streaming multimedia, and then on this side we have email, HTTP, FTP, RT, and remote terminal access, and so on and so forth. And so actually, once we are done with this chapter, the next thing would be TCP, UDP, because we start from layer seven and move down. So after application, the next layer is layer four. And then we go to IP, layer three. And then we go to layer two, which is ethernet. So that is the next chapter, yeah. Connection-less service means that you don't need to beforehand tell the receiver that I'm going to send you a packet. The connection-oriented, so basically when we come to TCP, 
there is a packet that we send first. We send a packet. If I want to send you a big file, let's say, so I will send you a first packet saying that I want to set up a TCP connection with you. And so you say, all right, go ahead and here is the connection number and here is the sequence number. I mean, I will probably say, that, okay, I will start my counting from 2000. The packet number don't have to start from one. I will start from 2000. You say, okay, all right, um, I, I'm ready for receiving. Then I send you packet number 2000, you send acknowledgement back. So that first packet is called connection. And connection less means that first packet doesn't exist. I could just send you a packet. It may have a sequence number, it may not have a sequence number. That's optional. I could just say, well, here's my voice. You could throw it, you could play it, and so on and so forth. There are many applications where UDP is very good. For example, um, if you're doing management of a network, so all the computers that are being managed, this is the managing, so I'm supposed to be managing server, right? All the computers that are being managed can send that, oh, I lost two packets, that information to me, and I can keep counting as to who lost what and all that. If I don't, if some packets don't make it, that's fine. Okay, so there are many applications that don't care the packets are lost. Those are connectionless UDP applications. Your question is that sequence number is not there, so the application will have to decide how fast to send and how much to lose. Yes. Application is totally responsible because really there's no transport. I mean, UDP doesn't do much. So now that you know the basics of the networking, now we can talk about the application layers. And we will go in this order, HTTP first, FTP second, and SMTP and so on and so forth. So let's just go with one. Now, oh, before we go, let's summarize this module, which was the application architecture. So five things we talked about. First thing we talked about P2P versus client server, which is more scalable. P2P, scalable means lot many more people can, can, uh, can be served with P2P. Second thing we talked about is that the application exchanges, when we talk about operating systems, the way we send the up messages in operating systems, we send it to sockets. Right? We make socket calls. But in the case of networks, the applications have port numbers and there are some well-known port numbers. And there are two transports, TCP and UDP. TCP is for reliability and UDP is for unreliable protocols. And same thing said here. Basically, it is, UDP is good for delay-sensitive applications.